Is anybody nervous? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're literally on this together because what we're here for is to get better. Tingling to numbness, primarily my left hand. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. This illness has taken a lot out of me, out of my family. Just the worst pain that I've ever imagined in my life. He's taking all these meds and he's no better than he was. Millions of patients with pain have become opioid addicted. We have this idea that when there's pain, there's something wrong with the body. It's not always that simple. Hysterectomy, colostomy, ileostomy, but then the pain came back. The brain is powerful and can cause almost any symptom imaginable. How does our life events affect our body? That's what we're going to go through today. It terrifies me. I can see that. I would reject the notion that everybody with chronic pain has a psychological origin. I don't expect Dr. Schubner to cure me. I call BS. It's pretty succinct <laughs> to the point. I don't know exactly what to expect. Living in fear is the perfect prescription for back pain, migraine headaches. People can retrain their brain, and that's what I'm asking you guys to do. I fought my whole life. Just tore my life apart. I'm angry and I'm sad. This treatment is not for everybody. Now I'm experiencing new symptoms, and so I'm freaking out. You're stirring things up. My shit is so stirred up. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how something you don't even know is there has that much power over you. Hello, Trauma Research Foundation community and viewers of our third annual film festival. Welcome back from watching this film that we just showed, our second one, This Might Hurt. We are excited to welcome two panelists to have a live Q&A with us for the next 25 to 30 minutes. Um, so do make sure that you have access to the YouTube subscribe and commenting function as we will be excited to take your questions, take your comments. Thank you to those who have already been sharing some of your thoughts with us throughout the film. Um, I'm going to be excited to share some of that so that our panelists can see what people have been saying and then get a little bit into our discussion. So before we kick off our conversation, um, just some time for some introductions. I'm Teresa Young, the Director of Operations here at Trauma Research Foundation and have been working with the foundation started uh, by Bessel van der Kolk and Leisha Sky in 2018. And um, this is our third year. We're featuring five different films and this is our second one. Mm -hmm. So... Tonight, we have with us Marion Cunningham and Dr. Howard Schubner. So Marion is the director, producer, co-editor. This is her first feature. So we're just congratulating her on an immense um, job putting this film out. She's an Emmy-winning filmmaker who's produced a series for Netflix, National Geographic, History, OWN, Discovery, and A&E. She and co-director Kent Bassett premiered This Might Hurt at the Austin Film Festival and are now working on a multi-year grassroots distribution campaign to share the work featured in the film with chronic pain patients, practitioners, and caregivers. So we'll take some time in our conversation to hear more about um, what the plans are coming down the line. And Dr. Howard Schubner is a professor of internal medicine at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He has been treating chronic pain patients for over two decades, during which time he's been refining his medical approach based on breakthroughs in neuroscience of pain. He's authored now more than 100 publications, including an NIH-funded study on fibromyalgia for the journal Pain, and a brain imaging study for chronic back pain patients that was published in JMA Psychiatry. He's also the author of the book, Unlearn Your Pain. So thank you both so much for being with us in our um, community and for 
putting so much of your time and your energy and your effort and your belief and your care. I mean, so much of your care um, into this film and bringing it into the world. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you yeah. for what you're doing here. And I don't think anyone has ever said those three words more nicely or sweetly, unlearn your pain. The way you said that, it was just beautiful. <laughs> it was impressive. <laughs> well, it'd be great to just start off. Um, you know, maybe first, I actually would love to just share some comments uh, that were was shared from our online audience. And then after that, it'd be great to dive in a little bit to you telling us a bit about how the f- film even started. When did it start? What inspired it? Um, so just to share some of what our community has been saying, Elizabeth commented and said, it's so great that this doctor really gets what chronic pain is all about. What a blessing. So glad TRF is getting the word out about this. Bows to you, Dr. Schubner. So there's one comment. Uh, Sherry said, this speaks to the importance of spending time taking client histories, which our insurance governed climate doesn't allow time for. Proper history taking is essential. And one more uh, quote from Ellen. This is more of a question is asking about combining your approach with allopathic medicine. Is partial recovery ever acceptable? Um, and another one that just came in, which is a big congratulations on this film, Marion. <laughs> So, yeah, maybe kick it off and tell us, you know, how did this start and what what inspired it? Yeah. Um, So my co-director, Kent Bassett, who unfortunately can't be here tonight because he is helping on his wife's uh, initial feature uh, directorial debut, which is very exciting for them. Um, But uh, so he actually had chronic pain in his arm when he was in college. Um, he lifted weights one day, lifted a little too hard, he thought. The next day he woke up, his arm hurt, and it didn't stop for a year and a half. He had to drop out of school, move home with his parents, get on disability. Like many of the p- patients you saw in the film, he saw over 50 doctors. Some of them told him that he would have to live with this for the rest of his life, which was very devastating for him. Um, one day he discovered the work of Dr. John Sarno and read um, Dr. Sarno's book, The Mind body prescription. And he got better overnight, which is crazy. Not crazy. It's absurd. Um, <laughs> but he uh, that doesn't happen to everyone, I promise. Uh, Kent might be a particularly susceptible brain. But, um, you know, once he went back to school and got his film degree, he started thinking about what his first film could be. And he thought back on his experience of this um, of this treatment and how it you know, healed him so quickly from what he thought was, you know, going to be a lifelong pain. Um, and he just had some questions. He said, you know, why did it work? Um, does it work for everyone? And why didn't anyone tell me about this for the first year and a half of being in pain? So he and I set off um, to make the film with those questions in mind. And Dr. Schubner was gracious enough to let us come and film his class. Um, so we spent a month in Detroit and then continued going back to follow the patients over five years. I don't think I was your first choice, though. (laughs) Sure you were. (laughs) Dr. Sarno was booked, but that's that's another story. And to be fair, it's interesting about Kent because he literally had his pain go away um, within a week or so. Uh, But then he started getting other pains. Yeah. You know, the fact is, is that because our mind and body are actually connected, shocking, uh, Stress and emotions activate the same parts of the brain as does physical injuries. And people who are human get physical symptoms when they're under stress. I mean, it's just as simple as that. And his brain was kind of put into this danger alert state in part through some things that happened in his early life, to be fair, and then things that happened in his later life, which triggered those memories and that's when he got his arm pain but later stresses in his life but that his brain was still kind of operated in this danger mode and so he started getting some other random pains over the next year or so and so he had to do i would say wouldn't you say marion i think he's done a fair amount of work in in um, in calming his brain and understanding himself and dealing with things from his past so 
uh, you know, it wasn't quite as as simple as that. I got an yeah. email last week from a doctor, young woman who's been in practice for 10 years. She started getting arm pain after being typing and being a doctor in <laughs> busy practice, seeing a lot of patients in pain who she couldn't help. And she, her pain got so severe, she had to quit practicing. Mm. And she uh, she was getting ready to even think about having surgery, which would have made no sense for bilateral arm pain. And uh, But the funny thing is, is her pain would go away when she would go on vacation. So it was obvious that... You know, it wasn't like some structural problem, mm. but no one could help her. No one in the medical profession could help her figure it out. And she came to one of our websites. Her pain started getting better. Within a month, she started doing a lot of the simple exercises we recommend. She's now pain-free in a month after suffering with pain for about five or six years. And she told her friends about this. She told her family about it. She told her doctors about it. And guess what? No one believes her. <laughs> <laughs> she's a doctor. <laughs> she said, this happened to me. <laughs> How can you not believe that this is what was going on with me? It's in, that's, that's really insane. Well, so I'm, I'm curious for both of you, you know, um, if you were to say, what is the overarching uh, hypothesis or conclusion that you're kind of working with? Because I, I'm, you know, it's, a lot of the skeptics, you know, they may take this and say, oh, are you saying that all pain, all chronic pain or all fibromyalgia or, or back pain um, is caused by this pain body mechanism? And of course, you know, there has to be so much research that's being that has to be done across these very specific conditions. But would you go as far to say that there's, you know, you you would guess X percentage of chronic pain cases are um, caused by some sort of the emotional pain body connection or what, you know, what is it that you're wanting to really propose or bring to the world as, as your uh, hypothesis? Right. Well, all pain is created by the brain. That's a fact. Our brain actually creates what we see, what we hear and what we feel. This is called predictive processing. So most doctors are unaware of this emerging neuroscience that is the reality of how our brains work. Uh, so all pain is real, therefore, because all pain is created in the brain. If you have an injury, the, the signals go to the brain, and then the brain will turn on pain usually, but not always. The brain decides whether it turns on pain or not. And as I said, stress and emotions cause the exact same parts of the brain to light up as a physical injury. So once we understand that all pain is real and all pain is 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 created in the brain, then we can say, well, when is chronic pain being triggered by an actual ongoing injury? And when is it not? If you take headaches, every neurologist who treats headaches knows that roughly 95% of people who with chronic, chronic head pain have what's called primary headache, which means there's no secondary cause, no brain tumor, no vasculitis, no bleed, no tooth problem, no sinus problem, no ear problem. That means 95% of headaches are caused by an, uh, are caused by what we would say is we don't know. So if we don't know, then what do you do? You talk to people and you listen to them and you take their history and you take time and you look for trauma and you look for stress and you look for how the pain started and when it started and how it comes and how it goes and how it turns on and off. And you will find if you, if you take the time that this vast majority of people with chronic headaches have a mind-body syndrome. And then you look at people with chronic abdominal pain and chronic pelvic pain and chronic neck and back pain. And the number is basically the same. It's in the 90%. If someone is diagnosed with fibromyalgia, that means it means if they've had reasonable medical care and testing, that the structural problems have already been ruled out. Same with irritable bowel syndrome. So when I started this work 20 years ago, I had no idea about this. <laughs> but, you know, when, when you do this day in and day out, and you see the incredible results that people can have, and you take the time to talk to people, you see that the vast majority of chronic pain is 
created by the brain in the absence of structural damage. We just finished a back pain study where we evaluated 220 consecutive people with chronic back and neck pain. And we found that 88% of them had non-structural pain, 88%. What's mm-hmm. the likelihood if you go to a doctor with back or neck pain, they're going to tell you it's non-structural? Very unlikely because your MRI is going to be abnormal. And they don't have the language to talk to people and care for people and love people <laughs> and understand them to explain that it's not in their, their it's not in their head. They're not crazy. It's not, it's not, you know, that they're faking it or they want the pain or it's their fault or they're mentally deficient. It's because their brain has reacted to stuff that's going on in their life. Mm. Yeah. Oh, do you mind if I add kind of- to that as well? Um, so the film is obviously not saying all um, pain is, you know, we're saying the pain is real. And I think what Howard's really great at saying as a practitioner is he's always telling his patients that the pain is real, but it may be being created by their brain. And you can see this like with all the conditions that he mentioned, as well as, you know, sometimes folks will, you know, break a bone and it will heal. Um, but they'll still have pain because their brain is continuing to predict that pain because they had it for so long. And also, so they can say, oh, so your brain can say, Teresa, Teresa, don't do that again. Like, be careful. We don't, you know, I don't want to get hurt again. So the pain can be created um, by the brain in so many ways. And um, also the back pain, um, what Howard was just saying about back pain, I really love the scene in the film where Howard is introducing this back pain p- study where 3,000 healthy backs were were imaged. So folks who have no pain um, and a lot of them had, you know, bulging discs or um, DDD, as he says, disc degeneration. Um, so oftentimes, especially with back pain, um, you are going to have an abnormal MRI, but that doesn't always mean that that is what is causing the pain. Mm-hmm. And, and we never say that we never say hundred percent. We never say everything right. across the board. Everyone yeah. needs an individual evaluation. And the last thing I want to do is tell somebody they have a neural circuit or mind body pain when in fact they have some structural problem. And obviously some people do have structural problems. I'm a doctor after all. Yeah. Um, so we want to be, you know, extremely, extremely careful Uh, but we also want to be honest and help people to see what the so they can understand what's going on in their life so they can understand why they have their stomach pain or their headaches or their back pain and what i found over the years is that it wasn't just pain it was anxiety and depression and insomnia and chronic fatigue and now we're looking at long covid and we're looking at a whole host of things where it turns out the brain is often, not always, everyone needs an individual evaluation, but often playing a major role so people can understand, you know, why they have what they have. Yeah. Well, you know, in this, um, in thinking about about your work and its intersection specifically with, with trauma, and it makes me think about, you know, how, uh, you know, if we're if we're young or something that Gabor Mate says, which is trauma is not the thing that happened to us. It's the way in which we responded to the thing that happened, which is the great news because we can, we can heal that. We can help that. We can change that. And Mm -hmm. so in thinking about trauma, um, you know, I think most people these days are having the understanding that when something happens to us, that's, you know, too much for our system to handle at that time, we develop and we do something or we have a pattern of our behavior in order to help us cope with that occurrence at that time. And what was interesting that I love that you went into in the movie was um, in the film is that you started asking them, well, is there, is there a relationship between you and the pain? Is there maybe something that the pain has actually helped it has helped you, has become, has it even become a friend of yours, a companion? And so just in the same way that with trauma, we're looking at different behaviors or coping mechanisms that have stayed with us throughout all this time, and that really they continue until our brain and our body and our system can feel safe and, and are, are able to process what then happened with our own system, 
that that pain is just in the same way something that is perhaps continually serving us and we don't even realize. And that in going through this program and in people asking themselves, oh, am I wanting to and am I ready to let go? Or am I wanting to look and see how is this pain even serving me unknowingly? That it's um, that that intersection for me, the you know, trauma to emotion to physical pain and where it plays a role in our lives was such a um, beautiful illumination. And so I guess my, my question for that is, how do you see your continual work or this film going deeper into work with trauma? Well, you know, not all people who've had trauma develop chronic pain or anxiety or fatigue or whatever, but almost all people that I've seen who have chronic pain or fatigue or anxiety or depression have had trauma. And now the spectrum of that trauma can be very broad and wide. I've se- I saw one woman had extremely severe trauma in childhood, unbelievable. And yet through her life, she was fine. She did well. And when she was 45 or 47 or so, something triggered it because of a difficult boss. And all of a sudden, everything came out. Uh, pain and these symptoms are a guide. They're a message. They're an alarm, like a smoke alarm. And they're leading us to something. There's a reason for them. And they're not the enemy. If you've studied internal family systems, you know, that uh, my friend Dick Schwartz uh, has developed, you understand that the symptom is a, a trailhead. It's a marker. It's something that is guiding you to telling you there's a problem. And it's up to us to figure out what it is. And so um, working with, working, so we're working on a couple different levels. We're understanding what the symptom is, and we're making sure that it's not a structural problem. Once we do that, then we're helping people to rewire their brain and change the neural circuits in their brain so they're, they're not making it worse by fear and focus and worry about it. That's what happened to Kent when he got better in a very short time. He realized that he wasn't really damaged and he stopped fixating on it, stopped focusing on it, and the brain turned off those neural circuits. But then at a deeper level, we frequently, not all the time, but we frequently need to address the trauma. And there's, you know, there's trends in, in, in the, in the fields of therapy where People say, well, we want to avoid it or we don't want to talk about it. Or if somebody doesn't want to bring it up, maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about it uh, unless they're comfortable. But, you know, we, we don't really serve our clients if we avoid things that need to be addressed. There's ways to do that that are gentle, that are kind, that are loving, that are caring, and that are not re-traumatizing to help people, what I would call realign and repair relationships. And a lot of this work is emotional work. It's actually dealing with the emotions that have occurred. And so when when we learned about that, it was just an incredible, incredible a breakthrough. And we've been refining that, you know, those kinds of therapies. And we have randomized controlled research trials now showing that this type of emotional expression work is is more effective than standard uh, cognitive behavioral type approaches. Mm. And that kind of leads into this, this other question, which is um, what do you say to people who may have this type of chronic pain who don't think they've experienced this big T trauma? And so I guess that kind of leads into talking to them about it being emotional work. Well, not, I mean, I, I've had chronic pain without big T trauma. You know? <laughs> uh, like I think you said earlier, Teresa, everyone has some sort of trauma. Everyone has hurts or criti- you know, feeling not good enough, uh, being criticized, putting themselves last, uh, um, you know, and just things that happen in their life that, you know, are hard to deal with neighbors, family, kid, all sorts of things. And so what we're doing is we're not focusing so much on trying to fit somebody into a mold. Oh, you must have had trauma. And then that trauma had to be reignited. We're just, we're just talking to people and seeing what were the things in their life that led in their specific case for them to start having headaches that, you know, just won't go away. 
or mm-hmm. start having stomach pain that just won't go away or start having fatigue that is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And it, if you just listen, you'll find what were the things, whether they're big trauma or little trauma, it doesn't really matter, you know, to me. What matters is understanding the person and helping them understand themselves and deal with whatever whatever trauma they had. We can do that. Yeah. 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 Um, when Dr. Schubner first sees a patient, we, we showed them the intakes in the film, uh, but we could only show them a few minutes. But he spends, you know, two to three hours with someone going over not only their medical history and every, you know, scan or test they've taken, but, you know, the events in their lives, the big T's, the little T's, you know, how they um, think about themselves. And if they put, if they're always putting others first, you know, he is really able to, you know, talk to them and get to know them. So I think in terms of, you know, the film, even though we're not, you know, using the word trauma informed very often in the film, I think we are hopeful that more practitioners, MDs, you know, therapists, PTs will be able to, you know, speak to their um, patients in this way and get this sort of like whole patient centered um, view of them in order to assess whether, you know, some of the difficulties in their lives, no matter, you know, if they're small or big are affecting um, the way their body is feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Want well, to, um, to bring this over a little bit into the other side, as you kind of talked about how you went about doing this, you know, it's it's amazing that it's it's great that you share with us. Um, you, there's all this long period of time to do the intake. You know, there's a long process to really understand people's histories, and um, you know the the diet the nature of which you had people grew up in peers and work with each other. You know that also felt very different than so many other um, films or treatments that we see, which is mostly this. Um, you know, a uh, therapist or doctor uh, patient model. And, and what was, what was interesting is I, I don't, I don't think I remember you really speaking to uh, why you're doing that. It was just, okay, we're going to put you in pairs now. And then, you, you know, you were seen coaching them to kind of say, ask them what it's about, you know, have them, is this an obstacle? Are they really sharing it? And, you know, I, let's not skip over that. This is so fascinating because the peer-to-peer model is actually something that um, we at TRF have continuously been wanting to hone in on because we do see the importance and the possibility of healing that lies in this peer-to-peer model. However, it can also be really tricky because especially when you're working with people with trauma, you know, there comes a sense of liability and holding and containment and safety. So a question is, um, you know, what do you feel is the possibility of treating, and we'll just stick with chronic pain for now, chronic pain outside of the patient-client structure and instead through peer support groups? And um, is this structure something that you would maintain as important and replicable, replicable to communities around the world who are really in need? And, um, you know, how would you recommend we, we, we do that in a way that's safe? Yeah, I think there's a wide spectrum. Uh, right now, I'm not using this model. Uh, you know, I'm not using the peer to peer counseling model. Um, I'm doing more individual work with folks on the other. And some people are doing groups. Some people are doing individual, but the books that we've written and the model that we've used, I think is, is applicable for people to use on their own, for example, safely. Um, and depending on, you know, how, if they're able to approach it. And I think the key for this is, is being, um, you know, helping, giving people permission to explore trauma, to explore emotions, but also giving them a safe vessel for it. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And so we don't want to err too far on the side of saying, yeah, everybody should just be treated by people who have no very little training. I don't think that's a good model. On the other hand, if we say oh, you can only be treated by people who have the most highly advanced training, then that may be too restrictive, I think. 
And so what I do is I, I work with patients individually with them using this model, the emotional awareness and expression therapy model that I talked about that we have studies on. And I, and it's in my book, how, how to do that. And we do it together. And then I say, okay, here's the model. And now you can practice this on your own as well. And that works out really well. There's a lot of people we've trained who are high level therapists and a lot of people we've trained who are um, coaches. And so, you know, there's, there's always the risk of, there's always some risk when you address trauma. I don't think we can really avoid that. That's true. Mm -hmm. But there's a risk in not addressing it at all either. Mm -hmm. And so if there's, if, and so what we're trying to do is find ways to have kind of matching, you know, <laughs> matching lower level trauma with you know, simple, simple models and maybe higher level trauma with more, uh, more sophisticated models. Mm -hmm. um, it's, oh, well, we, we don't really know, we don't know exactly what's best, but there's no question that you, you want to be careful, you want to be, uh, you want to make sure that you're not overstepping what, what you can do. And when we first started the film, you know, very few people knew about this treatment. But in the past few years, lots of online communities and apps have started popping up where there is a ton of peer support. That is, I think, really helpful um, for folks who are, you know, coming to it for the first time and saying, like, what is this? Um, it, you know, is this even going to work? And um, the way people encourage each other um, and offer advice if people have hit blocks is, is really successful from what I've seen. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. You really get giving the power over to the, to the masses and to people in order to um, <laughs> help people help people is, is a beautiful model of emotional care. Yes. Um, some other questions that have been coming in are just around uh, the different types of people that you've worked with. So for example, um, Someone was curious to know if this kind of treatment has been utilized on non-white folks and if it has the same outcome. And then also similarly, some people asking around um, age, have you worked with a very elderly? Have you worked with people who have had pain since childhood? Have you worked with children? So um, yeah, any anything to share on that? The, uh, the studies that we've done, and if anyone's interested in our studies, please send email me or send, uh, I can, you know, you can publish the email and, and also on, on the, this might hurt film.com website. There's a ton of resources, including a lot of our studies. I should mention that'd be a lot easier. My, my website on learn your pain.com. But, uh, so, so some of our, one of our studies was done at the VA hospital in, uh, Los Angeles. And so that was an kind of, and it was with older veterans. So it was a really great diverse population of older people, uh, people of color, and people who were uh, blue collar, and the results were fantastic. <laughs> and this was a randomized controlled trial, so it wasn't selected population. It was done by our colleague Brandon Yarns at the VA. And um, so we're confident that this model is not only for, you know, some select, uh, you know, white upper middle class people. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I would argue that two of the um, uh, patients we really feature in the film are not upper middle class. They're actually more in the working class camp. Um, I also think um, it's very important to mention that, you know, we we only got one shot at this and we filmed just this one class. And, you know, it is interesting and says a lot about our healthcare system in general that, of course, you know, there were mostly white folks um, in the class. Um, and obviously, there's a lot more work to do getting this type of work um, out to anyone who needs it. Um, and that's something that this might hurt is doing with our grassroots screening campaign. We, um, we actually just got approved for both CE and CME. So we are really focused on training 
um, future practitioners on this work. Um, I don't know, many of you know that a lot of MDs at least only get about seven hours of pain education in medical school, which is interesting because it is, you know, one of the most costly issues to our healthcare system. Um, so we are, you know, striving to make sure that that, um, is that this work is getting out to anyone who's going to be interacting with patients. And a lot of the trauma that occurs that sets up people for chronic pain, anxiety, depression, fatigue, et cetera, is not just interpersonal trauma. It's racial justice trauma. Systemic. Um, right. It's just, there's systemic and structural racism and poverty and a whole variety of issues that impact people in terms of trauma. We just wrote a paper on racism as a source of pain. And we wow. hope to, I think that's going to be published soon with us with a kind of a broad range of, of academics. And mm -hmm. so it's really important to understand the kind of breath because it's, as Marion said, it's a societal issue. The medical system is, is, is really messed up. I mean, they're rewarding people. Our hospital is losing money. They're not laying off people who are doing back surgery. That's unnecessary because that makes a lot of money. They're not laying off people who do back injections, which makes a lot of money. They are laying off people like me who spend time talking to people. <laughs> wow. And uh, so, <laughs> and our society obviously is, and Gabor Mate, Gabor's new book, uh, you know, I forget what it's called exactly. Uh, you know, something about it, how insane culture, you know, whatever. Anyway, Gabor's new book really uh, speaks to this issue. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, um, it's actually really timely that you talk about this new paper you're releasing on racism and pain. Um, our upcoming social justice summit that's happening at the end of January is all about um, having that big conversation. The theme of it is having big conversations racism, systemic trauma, and collective healing. And mm -hmm. so it would be um, it would be great to read that paper and what what you've kind of found around racism and, and pain because it is a much greater thing and how can we start having the conversation of how does our individual healing and pain and trauma connect into this larger web of that which we're all connected to of the system and the structure and intergenerational and everything that we've come from and continue to live in. So um yeah, love right. love to love for you to share that and we'd love to um there's there's such a tendency to blame the patient. You know, I mean children have pain and then you take the kid to the doctor. Well, the kids the kids are canary in the coal mine, you know, there's something going on in their life that's mm. causing their brain to send an alarm of pain or asthma or or um you know anxiety. Uh mm -hmm. we're seeing huge rate huge rises in not only and not only pain, but anxiety and depression in teenagers, especially with COVID, but even before COVID, uh, throughout the way, uh, the way society is. And, yeah. uh, it's traumatic. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have a, we have a friend who's Canadian who was living in, in, in California and she started getting all, you know, stomach pain and headaches and fatigue and couldn't think straight. And she moved back to Canada and she, her all symptoms all vanished. Living in the United States was toxic for her. <laughs> wow. Well, we're we're just about coming um, to the close of our Q and A. But perhaps one last question for you both is: what are your what are your plans for the film in the future, or what are your hopes that this film can bring the message that it's um, sharing going forward? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so we are um, working on a grassroots screening campaign, like I mentioned before, working especially to train uh, practitioners of all sorts. Um, but also we are trying to get the film out to patients, of course, because they could really use it as well. Um, and we're so um, excited with the way um, this work has grown. As I mentioned before, you know, when how, when we started the film, there were very few practitioners and Howard has done really great work um, training folks. Um, he does a lot of that now, um, nurses, 
doctors, therapists, sort of anyone that will um, <laughs> listen to him, he speaks to, <laughs> uh, to try to get them to uh, listen and, and learn more about um, the ways that we can help people. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. We have a small staff of uh, two folks who knock on doors and make phone calls um, and just try to have these conversations. So we're really um, excited that we're able to have the conversation with this community tonight. And thank you so much, Howard. Yeah, a- after, you know, after the, after the understanding of how the brain works and understanding of a medical problem and assessment and taking histories and understanding people, there's two main therapeutic modalities that we're using in this work now. Pain reprocessing therapy, which is to change the neural circuits in the brain and decrease the pain or other symptoms through that mechanism. And the other is emotional awareness and expression therapy, which is, as I, as you saw in the film, and dealing with underlying emotions, dealing directly with trauma. And we have trainings in both of those modalities that people can take if they're interested. And uh, we have new studies. We have uh, two, two randomized controlled trials in pain reprocessing therapy, two in emotional awareness and expression therapy, both showing amazing results. Uh, and we have some upcoming studies. There's a new PRT study starting in Denver. We just got an NIH grant to do an EAET study out of one of the medical schools in Chicago. Uh, we just submitted a, de- depart- a defense department grant that we have high hopes for. I'm, I'm starting to work with people at Harvard and pelvic pain, Virginia Commonwealth University and POTS. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on that's really exciting in this field. And, you know, we hope to partner with as many folks we can. And we're just really pleased and honored that you allowed us to present to your your group here. Wow. Well, it seems like you both have your hands very much full and for good reason. And um, we're so happy to support in whatever way that we can. Um, And we look forward to continuing to hear about your work. And now that we're all in touch, you know, please keep sending all the good news um, our way and we'll continue to uh, show up and be able to to collaborate in the ways that we can. So thank you both so very much. um, And we'll close out this day and again, thank the entire community for showing up to just sit back and watch some really important films with us with some beautiful messages and information. We look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but the next day, Friday for our third film. And again, don't forget to cast the audience choice award vote where we're going to be donating a thousand dollars to the winner to give to a qualifying charity of their choice. The link will be dropped for you in YouTube. Um, and again, thank you so much for just being a part of this trauma research foundation. Um, community. One last question that's come up now a couple times for you both is, is there a listing of uh, people that have come and gone through your training so that they can find that as a resource just to leave everyone off of that? Yeah. Um, Do you have that on uh, the PRT list, the PPDA list, the TMS wiki? There's three, three main lists that we have. And they're all on thismighthurtfilm.com. There you go. (laughs) Great. Okay. So you heard it go feel free to check out the film website, which is where you can find resources to find all of the people that have come through this miraculous training. So thank you both so much for joining us this evening and um, we'll see everyone again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. (laughs) Bye-bye.